Strange tales told be a Dubliner, be Turlock con me. Story number nine. The Spanish Lady. When I was a chiseler, I remember me father singing many songs of old Dublin. A favourite one of his was The Spanish Lady, though he only knew a few of the verses of it. It was a mysterious kind of a song, I thought even then. Who was this Spanish lady who was so elusive? And what was the Spanish lady doing in Dublin? Me father didn't seem to know either. As I say, he knew only some of the verses. And me a youth then, he was still singing it. And I heard it from other singers in the pubs and streets of Dublin. I asked him about it again. And again he disclaimed knowledge, only saying that this Spanish lady was probably a lady of easy virtue who plied her trade down in the port. I was trying to sing the song myself, but there were several different versions, as you might expect of a traditional song handed down from one generation to the next. When you heard all the verses, it was more mysterious than ever. The singer keeps meeting this Spanish lady doing various things and is enchanted by her beauty. But he never really gets close to her and in the end he is an old man searching all around Dublin for her. But she seems to be still the same. A beautiful, captivating but elusive young lady. At last, as an old man myself now, I have come to my own conclusion about what the song is about and who the Spanish lady is. I propose now to tell you the story as I understand it, interspersed with the verses of the song. I'll begin with the first verse that everyone in Dublin knows. As I walked out in Dublin city at the hour of twelve at night who should I see but a Spanish lady Washing her feet be candlelight First she washed them, then she dried them Over a fire of amber coals In all me life I ne'er did see A maid so neat about the souls Whack for the two roy o roy 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 It was the year 1765. Raymond McBride, a young man who was a Sizar, or poor scholarship student, at Trinity College, was out on the town one night. He wandered down to the port of Dublin, where there are places of entertainment to be found in plenty. As the hour approached midnight, he passed a house that was brightly lit on the inside. Other lamps shone through the open doorway. The house stood on its own small square. Outside the doorway, on the cobblestones, was a burning brazier, and beside it sat a young lady. She was washing her feet in a wooden bucket, and her long dress was pulled up over her knees. She was dark-haired, and dark-eyed too, obviously a Spaniard or some other Mediterranean beauty. She was the most wonderful specimen of feminine pulchritude that our hero had ever seen. Having taken her dainty feet out of the water, she shook them and began to dry them over the brazier. The atmosphere was magic. He was lost in contemplation of her. She looked up at him and smiled. But the stroke of twelve was striking. And a corporation watchman in his livery came by. The watchman told Raymond to be off at himself, as it was curfew. Otherwise he'd end up in a cell in the bridewell for the night. Raymond sighed and blew a kiss to the Spanish lady and was reluctantly off upon his way. 
I stopped to look, but the watchman passed. Says he, young fella, now night is late. Along with you home, or I will wrestle you straight way through the Bridewell Gate. I blew a kiss to the Spanish lady, hot as a fire of angry coals. In all me life, I ne'er did see a maid so sweet about the souls. The following evening, Raymond vowed to return there and see if he could find the Spanish lady. It was love and passion that emboldened him beyond all reason, for what chance had a poor young student like him to win such a prize? She was more likely to respond to the attentions of some wealthy fop, or maybe a city official with a coach to take her out riding in. Well, she's no match for a puddle suwaddy with her silver comb and her mantle fine. A hellfire book would better suit her drinking brandy and claret wine. I'm just a decent college sizer, poor as a sod the smouldering coals. How could I dress that Spanish lady and her so neat about the soul? She'd make a mot for the provost marshal Before the mayor in his coach so high Before a duke in Andalusia Kicking her heels in a cardinal's eye When blue as cockles, brown as hurtins Over a grid of glimmered and coals All for the sake of the Spanish lady An oar so neat about the soul Raymond sighed, but his mind was made up. He dressed himself in what good clothes he possessed, a coat and knee breeches, silk stockings and buckled shoes. He tied his sword around him and put on his tricorn hat at a rakish angle. It was coming up to eight o'clock when he went out, and it was still bright as he came to her house on the little square. As I came back to Dublin City at the hour of half past eight, who should I spy but the Spanish lady brushing her hair in the broad daylight? First she tossed it, then she brushed it, on her lap was a silver comb. In all me life I ne'er did see a maid so fair since I did roam. There she was, sitting at a first floor window, combing her hair with a silver comb and looking out on the square. She smiled to him and he waved up to her. I so much want to talk to you, he called from the square below. Will you not come out walking with me? A walk along the river, perhaps. We can be back before dark. All right, wait for me, she said and disappeared from the window. After a few minutes she appeared at the doorway, hurriedly draping a mantilla over her long black tresses. They went walking in the long twilight together. They walked out along the Liffey banks, and his enchantment with the Spanish lady, for such she was, grew greater by the hour. They strolled so far that it was long past the curfew, and he feared that they might fall foul of the law. Explaining this to her, he hailed a hackney coach that was going by, and she told him how to get to her house. They were off then, and the coach brought them back to where they had started, but on the way, they pledged their love. I asked her would she come out walking, and went on till the grey cocks crew. A coach I stopped then to instate her, and we rode on till the sky was blue. Combs of amber in her hair were, and her eyes knew every spell. In all me life I ne'er did see a woman I could love so well. As the coach rolled over the cobblestones into the square, the day was dawning. When they alighted, though, they saw a man standing before the door. 
Oh, she said in dismay, it is Tiger Roach. He is a notorious young buck around Dublin. He thinks I am his bell. Be prepared for trouble. What is this? Roach asked at the Spanish lady. Why have you not been home? And who is this young rascal you are consorting with? There's no rascal in it but yourself, spotted Raymond angrily. With that, Tiger Roach drew his sword. Raymond saw he would have to fight it out. He drew his own sword, and a duel began. Now, Tiger Roach was so called because of his ungovernable temper, and he had a fierce reputation as a duelist. But luck was with the younger man, and after a while, Tiger Roach carelessly gave an opening, and Raymond ran through with his rapier. Tiger Roach collapsed on the cobblestones, seemingly lifeless. The Spanish lady shrieked. Be God now we're in trouble, said Raymond to her. Call for the surgeons, will you? Or get one of your servants in the house to do it. He may be already dead. But when I came to the place, I found her and set her down from the halted coach. Who? there with his folded arms but the fearful swordsman tiger roach blades were out to thrust and cut never a man gave me more fright to lay him dead upon the ground while she stood holding the candlelight the spanish lady disappeared into the house looking around him he saw no watchman to his relief and no city guard either so, sheathing his sword, straightening his tricorn hat, and gathered in his coat around him, he fled through the still deserted streets, and didn't stop till he was back in his rooms in Trinity College. After this, Raymond feared to go out in the streets again, and he heard the news that Tiger Roach had disappeared, and that foul play was suspected. He determined to flee the city. In fact, he ran away to sea. He signed articles on a trading ship that was soon to leave port and shipped aboard as a midshipman. Raymond MacBride sailed the seven seas for many years and in the ports of Spain and South America he encountered many Spanish ladies but none the equal of the one he'd left behind. He never forgot her. On one voyage the ship chanced to dock in Dublin. Raymond felt sure that no one would know who he was and that Tiger Roach would have been forgotten anyway. So that very night, Raymond, who was now first mate, and his second mate, a man of his own age, went ashore. They walked through the old familiar Dublin streets and after a night of carousing, Raymond eventually found the way to the Spanish lady's house for he was tormented by the idea of seeing her if she was still living there. The place seemed just as before, the lamps lighting in the rooms on two storeys, and the front door open, a soft glow of lamps coming out. It was very late, long past twelve. Music sounded from the open windows. Raymond and his companion saw couples dancing, fashionable bows and their moths. But as they looked, there was something terribly odd about them. They seemed to be reflected in mirrors around the walls of the room, so that he could not tell how many of them there really were, and what were just their reflections caught in the mirrors. What was more, they didn't seem like humans, but like marionettes. They danced well, but they moved stiffly, like clockwork. In a pause in the dancing, one of the bows came out the door and stood on the low steps, smoking his pipe. Raymond shuddered. The man seemed like a skeleton. Then the dancing started again, and the horrid thing went back inside. Raymond groaned. His friend looked at him in puzzlement. These are the dead, dancing with the dead. Raymond muttered in a horrible realisation. But in the meantime, his friend, the second mate, 
had been attracted by the sound of music and dancing. He slipped away without another word and followed the marionette man in through the open door and went upstairs. Raymond stayed there for a long time, numb with horror, as he watched the skeletal dancers dancing. At one point he thought he saw the Spanish lady joining in the dance, then looking out the window at him. But before he could call to her, she was gone. To be sure, she was no skeleton, but as fresh and beautiful as ever. He stood there on the little square, watching and listening. Eventually things quieted down. The music died away. The lamps burned low or burnt out. And down the deserted street came the first timid glow of dawn. With a heavy heart, Raymond returned to his ship and reported to the captain that the second mate had deserted. As he never returned, the third mate was promoted. A new man shipped aboard to replace him and they left the port of Dublin a few days later. When his sea service was at an end, Raymond took passage on a ship returning to Dublin. There he stood on his native soil again. He walked the streets of Dublin, trying to remember where the Spanish lady's house was, but this time, for whatever reason, he couldn't find it. I've wandered north, and I've wandered south, through stony batter and Patrick's close. Up around be the Gloucester diamond, back be Napper Tandy's house. Old age has laid her hands upon me, cold as the fire of ashy coals. But where, oh where is me Spanish lady, a maid so sweet about the soul? Raymond had walked all over Dublin, north and south of the Liffey, and was just given up. When he chanced upon the old familiar house, and the old familiar square in front of it, it was dusk. There was no one there, and there was an eerie hush about the whole place. But there was the Spanish lady, sitting in front of her house, looking as beautiful and fresh as when he had once seen her. His heart went out to her with yearning. But what held him back now was his own grey hairs. He looked at what she was doing. She was catching moths in a golden net. Every so often she would get up from her chair and catch one. Always she brought them back and pressed them in the pages of a bound book she had. He came over. She looked up at him from her work. She slowly recognised him and smiled. As I came back through Dublin city, as the sun began to set, who should I spy but a Spanish lady catching moths in a golden net? First she caught them, then she put them into a book upon her knee. In all me life I ne'er did see A maid so fair as the Spanish lady Whack full the two right you right ye 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 So, she said, you are back. I knew you would be back. Just tell me the truth, he said standing before her. Why am I a grey-haired old man now, all me passion spent, and you still as beautiful as when I first saw you? What's the secret? Since you ask, I will tell you the secret, she replied airily. Though God knows, if you had once come into my house, you would have found it out soon enough. But you never wanted to join the bows who visited me, and still do. I thought as a poor student I had no place among the bows, and could not afford what you were offered. Now it would be the age I am. I can no longer pass for a young buck or a bow. Then just as well for you, she said. She chuckled to herself. Listen, she went on. 
All men and women age, and have aged, as you have. To defy the passage of the years, and remain beautiful, requires a terrible secret, which you will not want to hear, but I will tell you anyway. The men who come to my house in the vigour of youth never come out again. I trap them in my enchanted mirrors where they have to live a shadow life. I feed on their life, and they grow to be like skeletons after a while, thin and emaciated. Only on some nights after midnight I let them out so they can dance a while to my music. All the life has gone out of them, but they dance to the music, for their bodies respond to rhythm and desire. For I have women who live in this house, besides me. I have also taken the life out of them. They all eventually waste away and die, and then they might escape and go to heaven or hell, depending on their previous lives. But I catch their souls in the form of moths and prevent them from escaping from the house. I press them in the pages of my book. She picked up the leather-bound book on her lap and opened it for him. He could see page after page and moths pinned to the paper in rows. They never get away, she said. Their life strength is mine. That is how I remain as beautiful as I was the first time you saw me. And me friend, the second mate from the ship, have you got him too? I have, of course. He dances with me forevermore. There is hardly a drop of blood left in him. But I will have that last bit of him too. And Tiger Roach, he said with sudden realisation, did you take him too? She nodded. How cruel you are, said Raymond. You're quite without mercy. It is the price of life and beauty, she said. It's so cruel, I mean, to make all those lustful men suffer without end for their lust, and the women too. I spared you, she said, and smiled sadly. I denied myself you. That was my one sacrifice. I do not regret it. Nor do you, now that you know the truth. The musicians were tuning up and getting ready to play upstairs. I must go now, she said. The music calls. No, do not thank me. She picked up the golden net and the book full of pressed moths. She smiled sadly again, turned and walked into the house. Raymond McBride stood alone on the little square before the house, listening to the strange crowd assemble in the brightly lit rooms upstairs. Would it ever have an end? When it was dark, he turned and walked away through the streets of Dublin. You have been listening to The Spanish Lady by Torloch Con Me from Strange Tales Told Be a Dubliner. If you've enjoyed the story, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and comment. And so, until next time.